like father, like son. Today we see Jacob's sons repeat the deceitful scheming of their father, and even worse. On the Bible Brief. Jacob is finally safe in Canaan. Safe after a fearful reunion with his brother Esau. A reunion that turned into joyful tears rather than long-considered murder. Now in the land of Canaan, the story begins to shift to the sons of Jacob. Sons that will become the beginning of the nation of Israel. Jacob has 11 sons and one more in Rachel's womb. 12 sons from four women quite a house full of boys competing for the blessing of their father. A blessing that God hasn't promised to any of them, like that promise he'd made before Jacob their father was born. Here there's no promise of, the older will serve the younger. Instead, there's subtle competition. A competition in which the firstborn is the de facto leader. Reuben, Jacob's first son, would be the default receiver of the great blessing from his father but that doesn't mean that it's a foregone conclusion. Suppose Reuben lost the blessing. Who then would receive it? Well, it would be the next oldest brother. And if he lost it, then the next and the next and so on. In this way, the blessing could theoretically be given to any of the brothers. But as we'll see, Jacob also has a preferred and favorite son. Not the oldest, but the son of his favorite wife. There's tension in the text that we need to keep in mind for the remainder of the book of Genesis. Who will receive this great blessing from Jacob? As this theme begins to develop, we're going to see lots of strife and struggle among the sons of Jacob. But what of Jacob's daughters? The Bible doesn't significantly comment about his daughters, save one. The Bible talks about an event involving Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. A Canaanite man victimizes her, and she's avenged in a wrathful and unjust way by two of her brothers. And a quick note to parents, if you have children listening alongside you, this might be a good episode to screen before listening with them. Okay, let's read, starting in Genesis chapter 34. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she'd born to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land of Canaan. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. Jacob's daughter Dinah was apparently minding her own business when a young man named Shechem takes her, violates her in the most intimate way, and then tries to take her as his wife. Shechem has done a grave thing to one of the children of Jacob, especially considering that intermarriage with the Canaanites was frowned upon. Abraham resisted it. Isaac resisted it. But let's see Jacob's reaction when he finds out. Now Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it, and the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. For such a thing must not be done. Now we don't know here if Jacob is simply frozen in indecision, or if he's considering how to best deal with the situation involving the defiling of his daughter. It even appears that as Shechem's father comes out to meet with Jacob, that the two men might try to come to some sort of an agreement. But we get a sense of what's coming next as we hear the intense anger of the sons of Jacob. Shechem's father then offers a potentially tantalizing thing to Jacob and his sons. First of all, he offers to pay whatever bride price that Jacob asks for his daughter Dinah. But even more, he offers for all of them to begin intermarrying with the Canaanites, that they could become one people and share the land and take ownership of it. He offers that this budding nation of Israel might simply be subsumed into the nations of the Canaanites. And while we might expect instant rejection, 
Instead, the sons of Israel practice something that their father is familiar with, deceit. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully, because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to him, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition we will agree with you, that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Now at this point, we know that circumcision is the sign that was given to Abraham of the promises that God had made to him. Circumcision was the rite done to males on the eighth day after their birth to signify faith in the promise of land, seed, and blessing. Perhaps this was known to the Canaanites and perhaps not. But in any case, the sons of Jacob used this differentiating quality as a tool for deception. Shechem's father is pleased by their offer, and he goes home excited for the fact that they are about to subsume and integrate the people of Israel into their own nation. In short order, every male in their city is circumcised. Quite the surgical operation for a whole city. An operation that leads to the city's downfall and brutal vengeance taken by the brothers of Dinah. Next we read, On the third day, when the men in Shechem's city were sore from being circumcised, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. Levi and Simeon, the second and third sons of Jacob, take vengeance on the city and they significantly overdo it. The violation of their sister is returned in murderous rage on every male in the city. Not only was it deceit, but it was overkill. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? So soon after Levi and Simeon had done this thing to the city, Jacob harshly rebukes them. While it certainly wasn't right what Shechem had done to Dinah, neither was this act of aggression and malice by these two brothers. Jacob knows that they've caused him trouble and that there will likely be retribution by some of the other Canaanites. But even in this, Simeon and Levi provide a haughty response to their father, thinking that their actions were justified. Anger, it appears, has clouded their judgment so severely that they believe the murder of many is a fair penalty for the assault on their sister. But Jacob knows better. Now, oddly enough, it's in the midst of this event that God speaks to Jacob and tells him to go back to Bethel, back to the place where God had first spoken with Jacob. Despite Jacob's fear of the Canaanites pursuing them to exact retribution for his son's actions, he obeys the call of God. And on their journey to Bethel, we see God inspire fear in the Canaanites, keeping them from attacking Jacob's family. God is watching out for Jacob, even in the midst of his son's rash actions. Let's listen. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. With the episode surrounding Dinah largely concluded, God speaks to Jacob again at Bethel. And as he speaks, he confirms the covenant again, even echoing a command that he initially gave way back at creation. Let's listen. God said to Jacob, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. For Jacob, Bethel becomes the most significant location in his life. It was here that Jacob had seen the angels ascending and descending from heaven, 
It was here where Jacob had heard God speak those initial promises. And it was here, decades later, that God confirms these promises yet again to Jacob. Promises, including nations and kings, but especially the land, the land of Canaan. It's after this confirmation of the promises that Jacob finally welcomes his 12th son into the world. But it's in the midst of incredible grief and sadness, as the birth of a son precedes the death of a wife. As they're traveling away from Bethel, Rachel gives birth to a son who's named Benjamin before dying from the hard labor that she had just endured. The older son she'd given to Jacob was Joseph, and the younger was his new baby boy, Benjamin. Benjamin would become precious to Jacob. Just as the token of a long-lost loved one is precious to us, this son was that final gift given to him by Rachel. And Rachel was dead. The love of his life was in the grave. Now later, some time after Rachel's death, another of Jacob's sons makes an awful decision. Let's listen to what Jacob's firstborn son does, as the Bible gives us one short sentence about it. It says, While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. While the first sexual sin against the family of Israel was done by Shechem, one of the Canaanites, the next recorded sexual sin is within the family itself. Reuben decides to sleep with Bilhah, one of Jacob's concubine wives. And this time, the text doesn't leave us with any reaction from Jacob. Instead, it simply says that he heard of it. That's perhaps a signal to us that we should tuck this in the back of our minds, because this action of Reuben will come to affect all of Reuben's descendants. We'll come to see this later as the book of Genesis comes to a close. Now, after all these events, Genesis begins to zero in on one of Jacob's sons that we end up getting to know very well in the coming pages of the Bible. It's his older son from Rachel, named Joseph. And Joseph, well, he's the favorite child. He's the one who Jacob loves the most, and Jacob treats him like it even giving him special gifts that he doesn't give to his other sons. And you can imagine how this affects those other sons. Their jealousy turns to anger. Their anger turns to malice. And their malice begins to turn to an even darker place. And one day, as Joseph approaches them in the field, one of them whispers, murder. And the others agree. Join us next time as we see murder turn to slavery, blood turn to lies, and a father's joy turned into a lifetime of mourning. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible.